writing me to the European and uh, the theme that I chose is this uh, debate which is uh, growing and going on between Husserl and Heidegger for the uh, last many years. The first uh, smattering of the debate has started around 1926 when Heidegger published his Being in Time and uh, gave the first copy of Being in Time to Husserl. And uh, prior to that, it was not very evident that uh, Heidegger is not following Husserl's line of arguments. But in Being in Time, for the first time, Husserl made several critical departures from uh, uh, what Husserl has done in Ideas 1 and 2. Now, as far as Husserl's phenomenology is concerned, Husserl is more naturalistic in his phenomenological approach. Husserl's phenomenology makes a claim about scientific objectivity, rationality, that consciousness ultimately is bound by, and then comes uh, his uh, knowledge claim about the eidetic validity of the knowledge of the world. So therefore, he moves more or less within a trajectory of uh, reasoning that leads to an objective truth about the world. Now, in Ideas 2, he slightly modifies this position by bringing in the role of subjectivity and how acts of consciousness can constitute a world for itself, which is different from the world that stands outside. So, a dramatic world which stands over and against the world becomes the focus in Husserl's ideas too. So these two strands of arguments that Husserl has in logical investigations and ideas one and then in ideas two. The first one could be called as a strong naturalistic objectivistic strand and the second one could be called as the phenomenological strand of subjectivity, intersubjectivity, leading to a kind of valid knowledge. Now the notion of validity carries over the earliest notion of objectivity in terms of a naturalistic reasoning. Now as far as Heidegger is concerned, Heidegger has been maintaining a kind of tangential relationship with this kind of understanding of the world. Because for Heidegger, world has been always a source of pre-understanding. World is, world is thought over and once world is thought over, then it is possible to look at the world and then it is possible to formulate knowledge claims about the world. So there must be a prior layer of thinking about the world. Without that, Thinking about the world is not possible. This was one uh, line of argumentation in Heidegger until 1919, to be very broad about it. The second move that Heidegger makes after 1919 and 1923 is uh, relooking at uh, Kant's notion of noumenon, whether noumenon can exist, whether there could be thing in itself. And to that, Heidegger makes a very revolutionary proclamation that thing in itself is a kind of a uh, idealistic construct which is pursued by transcendental phenomenology as it is there in Ideas 1 and Husserl. So therefore, noumenon exists in the form of a thought or an idea. Basically, this is what Heidegger wanted to say. And if noumenon is just a figment of thought or a figment of imagination, then one cannot really conceptualize about the world. Heidegger draws this uh, revolutionary inference from the notion that noumenon is available within thought and it doesn't exist outside thought. And it is not possible to move from noumenon to phenomena. So, literally, Heidegger blocks the possibility of a 
phenomenological understanding of phenomena. And this is a kind of a radical departure that Heidegger makes from Hostel between 1919 to 1923. And further down the line, between 1923 to 1926, when Heidegger is fully preparing for writing his being in time, he is making even more radical argumentation. And one of the uh, arguments that he made is that this whole idea of phenomenological brevity uh, is an impossibility because the moment there is phenomenological bracketing, the bracketing itself creates a representation of the world. And representation of the world is nothing but representation as thought. So the way world is thought about, that is how world is represented. So thought and representation come together in phenomenological bracketing. But if thought and representation come together in phenomenological bracketing, can we think about the world? What happens to the claims of knowledge? What happens to the claims of being of the thought? From there, Heidegger further diverges and goes into a radical line of critique of phenomenology that finally culminates into his publication of 1926, Being in Time. And as it is known in being and time, the basic argument is that that being as a basis of our thinking about the world and the structure of consciousness through which the being understands itself is also an element in the very constitution of being. So consciousness simultaneously constitutes being and at the same time, being a constituent of being, it goes out and it allows being to contextualize itself in the world, in a situation of encounter. So therefore, it's all the way consciousness down. It's a kind of a top-down and bottom-up movement of consciousness. Top-down because the being moves from consciousness to a kind of a self-consciousness about itself and that self-consciousness further gets directed to the world in order to bring back an information about the world, back to the consciousness. So in the process one can see that there is a two-way movement, an inward movement to a certain depth of consciousness and an outward movement where conscious thoughts meet the world and bring back the world again to the consciousness. Now in this whole process, being remains something which is uh, stable and constant, recipient and also at the same time an agency that puts forth consciousness into the world and therefore being remains as the central figure in this up and down movement of consciousness. Now, now this is something fundamentally different from what Husserl thought about consciousness. Husserl thought about consciousness as independent of the human being. He also thought about the world as independent of consciousness. So the human being misses this connection between the consciousness and the world if we follow Husserl's uh, phenomenology. What turns out to be objective that doesn't require a kind of a deeper interconnection with the human being or the being that knows. So being that knows can be sacrificed in the process of knowing if it is to be a naturalized objectivity that uh, Heidegger argues for in the knowledge of the world. But in case of Heidegger, being remains the central figure, be it being with a capital B or be it being with a small b. Now this is how he begins his uh, being in time. And uh, the most important uh, thing that happens between Husserl and Heidegger is that after publication of uh, uh, Being in Time, Husserl became, in a sense, very irritated, if not angry. Husserl started making a large number of uh, comments here and there uh, to the other colleagues, and also in a, variety, in a number of letters, occasionally, which he exchanged with Heidegger almost some 20 letters that uh, Tom Shinnan has published and translated uh, in his book about Husserl-Heidegger controversy, 
in all these 20 letters which are written between uh, 1926 to 1931 uh, back and forth uh, responded by Heidegger in some cases. In some cases Heidegger didn't prefer to respond but Husserl wrote 26 letters and Heidegger responded in some 10 cases. If we take all these letters together, 26 plus 10, 36 letters, as Tom Shinan has taken and collected from Husserl archive in Leuven, uh, one can see that a debate is building up, a sense of distance and a sense of uh, uh, difference, which is very strong in Husserl because Husserl is uh, repeatedly affirming that Heidegger uh, is no longer following phenomenological rationality and diverging into something like a very weird form of idealism, which uh, finds uh, peculiar expressions in the formulations of being and time, none of which are straight and clear for, for Husserl. And Husserl repeatedly says that being and time is uh, undigestible, it, can, it is not intelligible, and all the formulations that Heidegger has made in being and time are basically uh, a kind of a deviation from phenomenological understanding of being in 26 plus 10 letters, you know, that happens. Now, I don't want to read those letters. These letters are available. If anyone wants to read, they can look at uh, Tom Singer's book on Husserl Heidegger controversy. But what I want to probably read here are the remarks that uh, Husserl made on the emergence of being and time, the copy that Heidegger gave, and some of the remarks which actually bring out various contours of their debate. Uh, those remarks will be interesting to uh, bring out here. So some of these remarks would be like this. For uh, Heidegger, you know, Heidegger considers that the what Husserl thought to be seen or sense, sense is the being with a capital B. Because the theme of transcendental philosophy is a concrete and systematic elucidation of those multiple intentional relationships which in conformity with the essence of being belong to any possible world whatever as the surrounding world of a corresponding possible subjectivity for which it would be the one present as practically and theoretically accessible. In regard to all the objects and structures present in the world for these subjectivities, this accessibility involves the regulation of its possible conscious life, which in their typology will have to be uncovered. Now Heidegger believed this. In contrast to that, Husserl will be saying that Dasein's mode of being or its modes of comportment about which Husserl theorized in various sections of being and time are a kind of a experiencing of the causal process of the relationship between being and the world. Husserl calls it experiencing causality. Design in its modes of being experiences causality according to Husserl. But in Heidegger's reading, design's modes of being is nothing but a kind of a intelligibility of being in terms of the sense of the world, the surrounding world and the corresponding possible subjectivity and access to that subjectivity. And that is what is sense is all about. And if that is what is sense is all about, then designs, modes of being are nothing but modes of sensing the world. Heidegger would say. While Husserl would say that this kind of comportment is nothing but an experience of causality. Now, design's comportment with the world or design's modes of being, can that be reduced causally if we read this comment of Husserl, which is there uh, in, the, in his reading of section 17, division 1 of being in time. So, Mode of existence is nothing but a kind of causality. What kind of causality is this? Now, if we look back to Husserl for answering, getting an answer to this question, in certain segments of ideas one and two, Husserl gives an answer to this notion of causality. And Husserl would say that natural causes are such that they work 
they work from the bottom and they come up to the highest level of approximation by the consciousness. So causality is a bottom-up process that starts from the world and that activates consciousness to gather knowledge about the world. So causality is a kind of a cause and effect relationship between the world and consciousness. And consciousness comes as an effect with an A. So here he is not giving a full description of causality. Rather it's a kind of a transformational emergence of consciousness. Consciousness emerges as a transformed being when consciousness and world interact with each other in a causal sense. So Husserl gives a rather transformative kind of an understanding of consciousness via causality. So it's not a straightforward causal relationship between consciousness and world because Husserl is a phenomenologist and therefore the phenomenological role of consciousness in gathering knowledge about the world is not entirely causal although world acts as the causal substratum for the phenomenological role of consciousness. That's what Husserl means. But what Husserl means in Ideas 2, Section 52, that he turns into a more scientific causal argument in contesting Heidegger's notion of comportment or modes of being. One can see that here. So that's a very, very significant difference. The second significant difference that arises uh, is the notion of ground. And as you know, the uh, notion of ground is much debated in phenomenological tradition, whether consciousness is the ground of being or being is the ground of consciousness. That is one question that Heidegger wanted to settle once and for all. And in Logical Investigations 1 and in Ideas 1, Heidegger categorically states that consciousness is the ground of being and being is not the ground of consciousness. Now you know Heidegger's position. Heidegger would be considering being as the ground of consciousness and not consciousness as the ground of being. Now you can see here a kind of a very clear difference. Now if we look at the notion of ground in phenomenological tradition, especially in Husserl, the, the ground is something like what one arrives at. Ground is not something like from where one begins. One doesn't begin from the ground, but one arrives at the ground only after the transcendental structure of consciousness does this full round of phenomenological reduction. One moves from world to the level of ideas and then deep into uh, a certain kind of a uh, transcendental reduction of the ideas into uh, transcendental ideas. So, and then to pure ideas. So, one moves from world to ideas to transcendental idea to pure idea in, in idea one and in idea two. So, you have these four steps of the movement in Husserl. And what you get at after the entire round of transcendental reduction is done, that is the ground. Ground doesn't lie out in the open for Husserl. Now, when Husserl said that consciousness is the ground of being, he meant that consciousness, after shearing off all the material qualities where it reaches <coughs> through a process of phenomenological reduction, that is the ground of being. <coughs> While Heidegger has put it the other way around, that you can never reach to that level of consciousness unless you start from the way the being is situated in the world. The situatedness of being, that is, that is what either it is authentic or it is inauthentic. But being has to be situated as the, as the first move in metaphysics. And once being is situated, then one can move up to phenomenological reduction and can recover being at a certain layer or level of consciousness, which is the outcome of phenomenological reduction. And that mode of being, where being has recovered itself, is the being in the world, because it is still connected with the situation where it is located in the world. So, from a certain situation of being located in the world, when consciousness works upstream and recovers a sense of being, that is the design. Design is not just design which is out there, but design is a whole. Design is not a fragment of consciousness. Design is 
the whole possibility of consciousness and therefore one can call design as being there. The thereness of design is, is not bereft of its consciousness activity or activity of consciousness. Thereness of design includes the possibility or full possibility of a conscious phenomenological reduction and recovery of the being which is situated in the world at the layer of consciousness. And that's what is the full description of design in being in time. So therefore, design for Heidegger is the ground. And if design is the ground for consciousness, then that requires a more intimate, inseparable connection between being and consciousness. And the inseparable connection between being and consciousness arises if and only if design is located in the world and not uh, in any other form. The fact that design is located in the world, that empowers the design to get a hold of the world as per Heidegger. But for Husserl, if even if design is located in the world and design is out there, but design is not sufficiently empowered to have an access in its own consciousness, not to talk about the knowledge of the world. If a design cannot access its own consciousness, how can it know about the world for Husserl? So Husserl is very, very suspicious about this notion of design as the ground. And therefore, Heidegger would say that the transcendental question about the status of design presupposes the ground of unquestionable being in which all means of solution must be contained. Here, this ground is the subjectivity of that kind of conscious life in which a possible world of whatever kind is constituted as present. So in a sense, ground marks an indissoluble presence of being. Dasein is the mark of or the signifier of an indissoluble presence of being there. So being there marks a kind of a permanent presence and being there as presence cannot be interrupted by causality. So it is close to causality. Indeed, causality remains outside the scope of being because being is the ground of consciousness. Now, now that's a very different way of understanding being where one is not really attending to the uh, possibility of an objective situated being knowing about the world through experiments or through certain methods of knowing. So this methods of knowing is completely kept outside in understanding of design as being in Heidegger. Now, this is an important difference, the difference about the ground. The third important difference that arises between Husserl uh, and Heidegger is about the intentional, the nature of intentionality. For Husserl, intentionality is directed by the, it, it is a directedness by the acts of consciousness. It is acts of consciousness that is directed out to, the, to the outside, to the world. But for Heidegger, acts of consciousness are not directed to Rather, Heidegger puts it very succinctly and he would say each phenomenon has its own intentional structure. Every phenomenon, whatever be the phenomenon, be it conscious, be it non-conscious, has its own intentional structure. Even a non-conscious phenomenon, for example, uh, later on which uh, took the notion of, took the form of arc of intentionality in Heidegger in his uh, work on the uh, work of art that a work of art has its arc of intentionality. Work of art is not something which is either conscious or non-conscious, but something that is in between conscious and unconscious. Similarly, every object in the world, in Heidegger's understanding, has its own intentional structure. Because every object is a phenomenon of its own kind. And one cannot really distinguish between one phenomenon and another. Uh, sorry, one can always draw a distinction between one phenomenon and another, just as one distinguishes between one object and another. The very distinction between one object and another is possible because each object and each phenomenon has its own intentional structure. Now, Husserl would consider that this kind of a understanding of 
intentional structure of phenomenon is problematic because only reflective phenomenon can have intentionality. You cannot have non-reflective, unreflective uh, phenomenon having intentionality for Husserl. While for Heidegger, whether it is reflexive or non-reflexive, it has an intentional structure because it is connected to other such intentional entities. It is in a certain kind of comportment and every possibility of comportment is, is created by an embedded intentional structure in, in, in Husserl. While in case of, sorry, in Heidegger, while in case of Husserl, it's only in the act of reflection that an intentionality is possible. Now, Heidegger would be contesting this kind of a position of uh, Husserl by saying that to be conscious of something, Heidegger makes this affirmation, to be conscious of something is no empty form. Rather, it is having of that something which is conscious. Now, this is something like are taking a little bit of an extreme position, knowing of a rock, you know. We, you know of a rock because rock is conscious. Heidegger is almost taking that kind of a uh, theological or pantheistic position in its being in time. In order to affirm that everything in the world has an intentional structure. Now this is a kind of a global notion of intentionality which Husserl won't agree to. Rather, he would say that if we are in a position, if, if a conscious agent or a conscious being is in a position to reflect on a phenomenon, then phenomenon comes within the intentional framework with which the conscious being is trying to know that phenomenon. So, consciousness is the root of intentionality, while for Heidegger, a phenomenon creates its own intentionality within which consciousness may come and in some cases consciousness may not even come but still it would retain its intentional structure. Now this is a very very significant difference. Now this difference of uh, understanding of intentionality finds a uh, very uh, very very uh, sarcastic and satirical uh, remark from uh, Husserl. Husserl was reading this uh, uh, second division, 8.7 to 11, being in time, and the text in the being in time says, uh, translated text, uh, uh, as Tom Sinan mentions, the guiding activity of taking a look, this is from being in time that Husserl is commenting on, the, this guiding activity of taking a look at being arises from the average understanding of being in which we, we always already operate. Now this is something very interesting. That we always already operate within an average understanding of being for, for Heidegger. And for Husserl, uh, this taking a look an average understanding of being is a kind of determination by the acts of consciousness. Husserl writes this in the left margin. He says it is obvious that taking a look does not belong to the entity. And also it is understandable that average understanding of being is a determination by the acts of consciousness that the being operates with. So there is a certain sense of operative intentionality to which uh, Husserl almost conforms to in responding to the global intentional structure that uh, Heidegger proposes, uh, which earlier he was not ready to accede to. Because for Husserl, one can have access to consciousness provided consciousness is directed upon itself or anything else. Otherwise, one doesn't have that access. So, the intentionality that must be there in the consciousness acts as the root of the work of intentionality. While, for Hus where, while here Husserl is taking a little different line, saying that in particular instance of intentionality, such as taking a look at something, that doesn't belong to an entity, but yet you are able to take a look 
and that is something operational. Now, how an embedded intentionality turns into an operational intentionality is not very clear in Muslim. While in Heidegger it is quite clear because we always operate with an average intentionality for, for Heidegger. I mean, as human beings. An average intentionality is inclusive of creatures or rocks or other such non-conscious entities as well. So you cannot really separate non-conscious entities from the intentional structure, the average intentional structure with which human beings are operating. So you can see here a serious theoretical difference. The implication of this serious theoretical difference is that Heidegger is on the way to propose a global ontology of being. Because a global ontology of being arises from a global intentional structure. Husserl doesn't want to commit himself to an ontology of being. Rather, as you know, Husserl remains committed to an ontology of entities. Entities which are without subjectivity. Entities which can be objectively known. Entities which arise as part of our experience has to be proven, tested in terms of whether others also experience those entities in the very same way or not. So the same way of experiencing entities between number of people remains as the criterion for knowing uh, the truth of those entities for Husserl. So Husserl's intersubjective move only supplements his hardcore notion of objectivity. While for Heidegger, Intersubjective move is nothing special because we all are already embroiled into an average uh, structure of intentionality. One really won't have to look for an intersubjective evidence for justifying one's belief in a certain piece of information. Now, the other important difference that arises between Husserl and Heidegger is about the status of psychology. As you know, Husserl has elaborately written on phenomenological psychology which uh, arises from this phenomenon of breaking out the world and to have an epoch, epoch of the world, which is a kind of a bringing of the world as self-evident by bracketing out uh, the world or the immediate experience of the world is the epoch where world becomes self evidently real and instead of positing a world in advance or positing a pre-given world, epoch brings the world as self-evidently real world and that is what is Husserl's phenomenological psychology. As opposed to that, Heidegger would be saying an epoch is nothing but temporalization of the objective sense. Epoch is simply temporalization. And temporalization really doesn't require an objective strata for itself. Temporalization can happen as part of the internal time <coughs> consciousness. Internal time consciousness is freed from the, the tethers of objective, causal, external reality. It's rather internal to the conscious being. And therefore, psychology is best understood in terms of internal time consciousness. It's, it's a certain ordering of the experience of time that makes human mind work. And this is what Hubert Dreyfus further extends this thesis of uh, understanding of Heidegger's notion of temporality into, into a notion of objectivity because temporality marks how the objects are grasped or captured by the knowing subject. So it is a series of temporal representations for Hubert Dreyfus, which is part of the arc of intentionality, or which is part of a larger flow of intentionality, which takes the subject to the world. So this directedness of the subject to the world can be best understood in terms of how the subject temporalizes, how the subject arranges its own experience of the world in temporal sequences, in terms of ordering it in temporal sequences. Therefore, phenomenological psychology is certainly not epoch or bracketing out or bracketing in. Rather, it's a kind of a temporalization 
of the knowledge of the world, which is really uh, very significant. Because this temporalizing move actually opens up phenomenology to a distinctively different understanding of time, which finds its expression in being in time, where time becomes a certain mode of historicization later on in, in Heidegger. And historicization in Husserl, again, uh, takes a very different shape. Husserl considers historic historicization as a process of sedimentation of historical experience. Historical experiences are sedimented. They are collected and sedimented in memory, in belief, in knowledge claims, in discourses, in narratives, in every form of expression for Husserl. While for Heidegger, it's a dynamic activity. Temporalization never ends. It's an ongoing process. One is able to sediment, but what is sedimented is also opened up to newer experiences. So temporalization would mean opening up to a newer experience for Heidegger. While for Husserl, sedimentation is continually going backward, regressing into past experiences or depositing and storing experiences in the form of past experiences or stored experiences as if it's a kind of a stasis, it's a state of memory. And here he uses this notion of passive synthesis. Now Heidegger would like to use the notion of passive synthesis rather for Heidegger. Temporalization is an active synthesis that moves from memory to the current experience and memory is made present all the time by the process of temporalization. Therefore, the notion of psychology also becomes very different, phenomenological psychology. For Heidegger, phenomenological psychology is part of design's comportment. It's part of design's everyday lived experience. And the ontological analysis of design as discovering the horizon for an interpretation of the meaning of being in general for Heidegger would mean an ongoing process of temporalization of memory into the presence. So, design functions by temporalizing the past into the present, the memory into the present, and turning the present again, opening up the present to future happenings in the future. So, it's a dynamic process. Now, Husserl would be very irritated and angry about this description of epoch because epoch seems to be one of the most fundamental uh, uh, phenomenological uh, procedure for Husserl, which Heidegger is simply sacrificing. So he would be writing uh, uh, in uh, second division in one of the margins he writes that the fact that design is self-conscious that shows that design's own most being, using Heidegger's expression, design's own most being entails having an understanding of that being and always already maintaining itself in a certain interpretation of its being. So design's self-understanding for Husserl becomes very important. It's more important than temporalization of experiences into present or turning present into, or opening present into something that is going to come. So, in other words, Husserl is trying to say that design always already have an interpretation, or an interpretative perspective on what is happening to its own experiences. And therefore, it may, may not have, an, it may not have a procedure of dynamic temporalization at all. Now, Husserl further uh, goes into an, exp an explanation of uh, this process of temporalization by dynamic process of uh, temporalization by reducing it uh, to an expression that, that he says temporalization is nothing but they are ways of being in the world, he admits for the first time. They are ways of being in the world. Temporalization is just ways of being. Now, ways of being is pretty vague. Of course, it clarifies later, uh, two or three sentences later, in the same margin, calling it a kind of a concern for uh, design. 
So Dasein is concerned about itself, and that's what is the way of being, and that's what is also the multiple possibility of Dasein. Uh, in fact, uh, one can see here, Husserl is crafting his argument in Heideggerian terms, instead of opposing Heidegger, which he opposed, by thinking that temporalization is a static process, it's a process of depositing in memory, and he shifts from there and admits to the point that ways of being in the world is a kind of an expression of concern, and that expression of concern is dynamic, and, and that is again uh, something like an always already maintaining itself in a certain interpretation of his being, which is, uh, which again he calls as a kind of self-consciousness. Now this is where he, uh, in the process of opposing Heidegger, he almost comes to a kind of a certain agreement uh, with Heidegger. But he will not give up his disagreement, despite this agreement with, with Heidegger. He won't give up his disagreement. So uh, in the next section of the text, uh, which is in the second division and the uh, and uh, section 56 to 62, where Heidegger is delineating uh, the existential delineation of any possible resolute design that includes the constitutive items of heretofore passed over existential phenomenon that we call situation. So Heidegger would be arguing about situatedness of design, but Husserl would be frowning at that uh, notion of situation uh, because Heidegger turns situation into authenticity and Husserl is asking this question, why is situation related exclusively to authenticity? Husserl is not able to understand why situation of design, Heidegger calls it authenticity, why it should be exclusively related to authenticity? Heidegger is asking this question. Is it because the design carries a deep sense of guilt? And whenever design is able to do something, the sense of ability actually doesn't give him give the design any satisfaction or fulfillment. There is no achievement of intentionality there, but rather a sense of guilt. So what Husserl is asking to Heidegger is that the notion of situation as authenticity is only compounding a sense of guilt in design. The design is not able to overcome a sense of guilt. Even if the design is able to relate to a certain situation and even if design is able to achieve some amount of worldly prestige and abilities, Still, the individual design is necessarily guilty because design feels that it has a certain ability. If design didn't feel that it has a certain ability, design would not have felt guilty. So, Husserl becomes very ticklish in understanding Heidegger's notion of authenticity. He's trying to negate the notion of authenticity by bringing in design's possibility of feeling guilty in a certain situation. And then he demolishes Heidegger almost by dubbing this entire understanding of existence or existential, existential situation of design as a theological ethical discourse. He calls it a theological eth ethical discourse, a kind of an elliptical cryptic remark that he makes in his own handwriting. Now, uh, Tom Sinan, in his understanding of this uh, elliptical, elliptical <coughs> remark, uh, goes back to Husserl's text, where Husserl is trying to say that history becomes a kind of a history without a subject. History doesn't carry with it a trace of subjectivity, as Husserl argues towards the, uh, in some parts of Ideas 2, towards the end of Ideas 2. History carries only a remainder of subjectivity. Because the subjectivity of an individuated human subject is only anthropological and it is not able to encounter different kinds of human beings who belong to another culture or another community. Although, ideally, all the human beings who belong to different communities and different cultures have a universal structure of understanding, according to Husserl. So, 
Tom Shinon refers to that. And by referring to that, he is saying guilt is the mark of a fragmented, remainder subjectivity, which is not there, of course, in Heidegger. For Heidegger, subjectivity is total, it is emerged in a situation, and it has this ability to be always already there with an interpretive perspective on itself as well as on the world. And there is no fracturing of that interpretative perspective that the subject takes up on the world in, in Heidegger. While in Husserl, the very possibility of interpreting one's own situation is historically broken. It can never be a situation that the subject can understand to be its own situation. Therefore, there is nothing like an authentic situation for the subject or subject's understanding of its own history in Husserl. While in Heidegger, it is very much there, although Husserl tries to dub it as a theological ethical discourse. Uh, suffice it to say that this debate between whether Heidegger's position on authenticity is theological or it is historical, uh, that debate cannot be so easily resolved because uh, it can be both at the same time. And at the same time, one interpretation of this can stand against the another interpretation of this. Therefore, I would like to take a position on this particular matter. The other thing, which is the crux of Australian objection to Heidegger, is a straightforward objection to ontologization of being. Husserl would be saying, one presupposes too much and too little for the ontology of design if one sets out from a worldless eye and then tries to provide it with an object and with an ontologically groundless relation to that object. I think I am making this comment in, uh, in towards, the, towards uh, somewhere as he was reading down Division 2. He says that there cannot be worldless eye now, as far as we understand Heidegger, Heidegger never said that design is without the world. Design is always situated in the world. And design's relation to the object can be ontologically grounded. It is not ontologically ground groundless, as Husserl is trying to put it. So therefore, Husserl's misunderstanding of Heidegger, as Husserl grows in age and, uh, and uh, grudges with a lot of rage and anger, to come to the position that he declares in one of the letter to uh, one Mr. Alexander the founder that uh, Heidegger has completely deviated from the phenomenological tradition and he should not be considered at all as part of the writing of any phenomenology. He made a very, very clear, uh, he gave a clear certification that Heidegger has deviated from phenomenological tradition. Now, this kind of a probably understanding or misunderstanding within Brecket by Husserl also continues uh, between Heidegger and Husserl. As Heidegger is given his uh, other book, Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics to Husserl, he gifted that book. And already Heidegger was aware that uh, Husserl is totally dissatisfied with his writing of the being and time, yet he offered, out of some reverence or whatever reason, offered a copy of this Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics to uh, Husserl. Again, Husserl did the same thing. He started uh, uh, making several kinds of notes and some of these notes uh, I would like to uh, bring to your notice. Elaborate uh, writings are done already on these notes that uh, Husserl made on Heidegger's uh, uh, gift of that copy, Kant and Problem of Metaphysics. I have uh, taken up a few notes. One of the notes uh, is that in Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics, Heidegger is reading Kant and uh, Heidegger is making this kind of a comment in uh, section 18, section 19, 20, 27.34 and some other references are all available. The text goes like this, text in Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics. The organs that serve affection are thus sense organs because they belong to finite intuition, that is, sensibility. With this, 
Kant for the first time attains, attains a concept of sensibility which is ontological rather than sensualistic. To my mind, Heidegger is correctly reading Kant. Of course, is bringing ontology there. Does Kant have an ontology of senses? Well, it's difficult to say that Kant has an ontology of senses because senses work in order to create an ontology at a much later stage. When the senses meet the noumenal concepts and can fall under certain precisely determinable concepts, then probably an ontology comes through. So Kant in the very beginning is never ontological. But Heidegger would say no, no, Kant from the very beginning is ontological rather than sensualistic. Uh, so Husserl is making a comment. Husserl is saying if Kantian notion of intuition is ontological, then it cannot be related to sense organ at all. Rather, sense organs will become only conceptual. Sense organs will not have anything sensual. They will become conceptual if, if Kantian notion of senses is to be ontological. I think we go with Husserl there because Husserl is seemingly right in, uh, in Heidegger's twisting of Kant to an ontologization, ontologization of being and subjectivity that Husserl, that Heidegger wants to do with Kant. In other words, Heidegger would be saying that there is no empirical sensuality. The sensuality that the sense organs have are all non-empirical, which, of course, Husserl in a justified way tries to correct him, saying that then sense organ only will be conceptual and it will no longer remain sensual. In another place, the text in uh, Kant and the problem of metaphysics reads, it follows then that if empirically effective intuition of beings does not need to coincide with sensibility, the possibility of non-empirical sensibility remains essentially open. Okay. Now, Heidegger is making this statement. It follows then that if empirically effective intuition of beings does not need to coincide with sensibility, then it is a kind of a inferential argument. Now, Husserl is writing in a tarsus so a dotted really follows. And Husserl then goes on to say that empirically effective intuition of being does not really coincide with sensibility. Empirically effective intuition of beings are not even open because intuition of beings must have an intentional structure. And whatever they are directed to, they are directed to that. They are not open at all. I think Husserl also here partly is correct. Because non-empirical sensibility that Heidegger thinks of is a very difficult thing to probe into. Except saying that non-empirical sensibility is part of the consciousness. But if consciousness has to be understood in terms of sensibility or how conscious sensibility goes towards the important, then sensibility has to be empirical. It cannot remain non-empirical. I think Postal is correct here. So, the next section of the Kant and the Metaphysics of Heidegger reads like this. Knowledge is a primary intuition. Heidegger says, knowledge is a primary intuition. That is, a representation that immediately represents the being itself. So, the being itself is represented in knowledge for Heidegger. Now, Husserl underlines, immediately represents and itself. And then he cryptically writes, is this Kant? I think Husserl is right there. Kant will never sub subscribe to this kind of an argumentation that an immediate intuition is representational. An immediate intuition brings sense data and this sense data is ordered in a certain way in order to create the manifold of representation. So therefore sense data primarily is not representation. 
So Houston is probably uh, making a very, very empiricist kind of a critique of Heidegger. And at the same time, he's pointing out how Heidegger is confounding between representation and the sensible. Heidegger is not able to maintain a distinction between the sensible and what is represented through the senses. There should be a distinction. So I'll give one more and then I'll stop this uh, discussion on content problem of metaphysics and go towards uh, the notion of anthropology. In the next section, section 18, or uh, 27.13 in the uh, content the problem of metaphysics, Heidegger writes, finite intuiting creatures must be able to share the specific intuition of beings. Finite intuiting creatures must be able to share the specific intuition of beings. Now, Husserl is writing, is this Kantian? Does Kant anywhere say this? That finite intuiting beings share their intuition of being. Do they share at all? <coughs> I mean, Kant, of course, doesn't ask this kind of a question, nor Kant commits itself to that kind of a position, <coughs> that these intuitions are shareable. Rather, finite intuitions, as it happens in Kant, results into a kind of antinomy or it goes towards a kind of transcendental dialectic instead of being shared with others. So therefore, Husserl is justified in asking this question, is this Kantian? So what turns out from Husserl's comment on Kant and the problem of metaphysics is that Heidegger has misinterpreted Kant terribly. Now Tom Shinan is asking this question, what was Heidegger's compulsion in wrongly interpreting Kant? Is it the case that Kant's epistemology stands against Heideggerian notion of design? Of course, one cannot give a straightforward answer to this question, but suffice it to say that a Kantian epistemological framework cannot accommodate the role of consciousness as being there and also at the same time being conscious of the world. Simultaneously, it cannot be self-conscious and conscious about the world, which is there in case of Heidegger, which is a positive affirmation of being. Kant won't be affirming being in that kind of a positive way. Rather, Kant would avoid the question of what is being. Kant is not an Aristotelian. Rather, he will extend the Platonic argument in terms of its distinction between noumenon and phenomenon. So, therefore, Heidegger has somehow got Kant completely wrong. And I think as far as Kantian text is concerned, Heidegger is not at all true and sincere to reading of Kant's uh, critique, any of the critique, except probably third critique, which comes close to Heidegger's notion of art of intentionality or work of art, because work of art assumes a certain form of sublimity, Work of art assumes a certain form of novelty, and work of art doesn't really require an objective reference to the world. So, in a sense, Heidegger read third critic in a better way than first two critic, and he goes quite mistaken in the first critic, critic of uh, pure reason. He goes quite quite mistaken. Therefore, what turns out from this entire difference between uh, Heidegger and Husserl, and this is where I'm going to end in the next five minutes, is narrated by Husserl in one of the entries that he made in Encyclopedia Britannica, which is published with the title Phenomenology and Anthropology. In that essay, which is an essay of some 14 pages, 10, 10 14 pages, the essay is of tremendous importance in its uh, historical value. Primarily because in that essay, Heidegger is making two basic claims. One claim is that phenomenology cannot stand alone. It has to become anthropomorphic and anthropological. The anthropological notion of being must find a place within phenomenological reduction. 
An anthropological notion of being also must find the role of a knower, role of a conscious knower in its relationship with the social and cultural world. Without an anthropology of being, it's not possible to understand the cultural and the social world. He makes this claim for the first time. And that too in opposition to Heidegger's notion of design. His only concern is that Heidegger's notion of design is not sufficiently anthropological. Rather, it is very historicist and ontological. It is really not giving a place to diversity of cultures in the world. It's not really assuming the form of culture as a rigorous science. Rather, Heidegger's notion of design is full of subjective misreading of the relationship between the subject and the object. It really doesn't become an intersubjective notion of being. And therefore, the notion of being has to be anthropological. That is one claim that Husserl makes. The second important claim that Husserl makes is that phenomenology must have to go towards scientific rationality. All that phenomenology does in the form of recovering the lost grounds of being is to resituate being in the objective world. Being has to be situated in the objective world. And being can be situated in the objective world via an anthropology of being. And an anthropology of being can rest itself on a certain intentional structure by which the being can relate itself to the world in a meaningful way. So the act of meaning constitution by the being requires a combination of scientific objectivity and an anthropological correctness. Now this is again a kind of a response to uh, Heidegger's notion of design because design Design has this quality of comportment, which is not the essential quality of design. Rather, it's a kind of a adventitious quality of design. The design has this capacity of comportment. Even without comportment, design can exist on its own. So, comportment or design's encounter with the world is not the main substance of design. Rather, design stands on its own, as if design is a kind of a independent, complete, autonomous subject or an autonomous substance, somewhat like a Leibnizian monad, Husserl will point out, which can have its self-understanding ingrained in its own consciousness without really encountering the world. So therefore, design becomes a completely subjectivist kind of a notion, which Husserl wanted to uh, relinquish in favor of an anthropological notion of human subject who has this phenomenological role in finding herself in the midst of the world, in finding herself amidst other beings, other cultures, other civilizations. So therefore, some commentators have made this interesting comment. Notably, I will cite uh, one commentator whose comments were uh, very interesting he is uh, uh, Stephen Corwell who has written this question he has asked a question is Husserl Heidegger feud based on a mistake a very interesting paper that he wrote I think some 10 years back around 2002 where he had shown that uh, this kind of a dispute between Heidegger and Husserl actually doesn't lead us anywhere rather uh, he says uh, in the kind of a concluding comment that he makes on that, uh, he says, when Heidegger implies that Husserl's transcendental subject is still too Cartesian, that it is subjective in the sense that it loses the world, he too is mistaken. The church does not hold true of the kind of psyche that emerges from parallel abstraction. So there is this parallel abstraction between Husserl and Heidegger. But the transcendental subject is not a subject in this in, in the sense in the sense of abstraction and cannot, he says, as I have tried out to show, be reached by way of it. So there is an ambiguity in this entire difference between Husserl and Heidegger, as Corwell points out. The ambiguity is about the status of uh, anthrop anthropology. 
as the object of worldly sciences of man and also about being in the world, whether being in the world is a transcendental subjectivity or not. So these are the basic uh, kind of a misunderstanding that went on between Husserl and Heidegger, which finally led to when uh, Heidegger became rector, he wrote a secret letter to the Nazi party asking for execution of Husserl, for which Husserl had to leave Germany and take shelter in America. And where is this, this last record? <laughs> which one? You mean execution? No, no, in a letter written to the uh, Fuhrer. Uh, Expulsion of the. Evil. Expulsion and execution. Expulsion and execution. I never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, so that's. Uh, that is, that's okay, all right. <laughs> so. That may be an overstatement, I admit. Mean, okay, <laughs> expulsion of Husserl. And then Husserl had to run away. I have an actual document of it. I have not read that. Yeah, yeah. Sure, I have read No, 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 this is just like, you know, this is the 1933, and uh, so it's almost like a, a trend in most of the old universities in Germany expel the Jewish intellectual, and Heidegger being the rector. You know, took that option. That's all. I mean, there's no suggested. Suggested that. Not that they make a document. Anyway, yeah. there's both both ways, but <laughs> some people told me it was a document it's about it. Rather than you go to, we we'll just speculate on that. How they really looked at yeah. it. Why? Yeah. Huh? It goes to Leah Jorgensen's son. Uh-huh. Where did he go? We go to Belgium. No, Husserl remained in Freiburg. Oh, he oh yes, sir. Husserl was in, he, only thing he could not teach, that's the Lehr Verbot. Yeah, that he was in Freiburg. Yeah, Verboten. Verbot, Lehr Verbot. And he, uh, exactly lived in the Mercy's Street. But then, uh, he died. I mean, he, he was. So he died. He, he, died. Died. he was not touched. Huh? Huh? He was not touched by the Nazis. No, 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 no. 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 In both not even the Lehr. I, I thought he went to Belgium. Yeah, he went to Belgium. Yeah, he went to Belgium. Yeah, he went to Belgium. No, I mean, of course, the. Uh, he went to. He went in hiding. He went to Belgium, Leuven, because yeah. Leuven had all the. The problem is, like the, the Husserl's, the Schuler, the students, they were afraid because they saw all documents would be destroyed. So they took to Leuven. Anyway, I don't commit myself to this. This is just a gossip. <laughs> <laughs> the other part of the talk that I can Anyway, yeah, that's, that's a that's philosophical part of it. <laughs> no, if, that, if there were a record like a letter, it would have been a real scandal in the in much earlier. And, and in the early case of National Socialism, I cannot expect that. This is just a, a preparation, preparatory ground. Unfortunately, he died before all this um, Auschwitz and all this Holocaust. And all. Heidegger was never shattered. Huh? Heidegger was never shattered. Ever. Even after. Uh, leaving the rectorship, even of after course that, he, so was, he, he was shattered. He, uh-huh. was, he was shattered. He was very isolated, uh-huh. and he, he I, I mean, people say he did never regret it. I know that is true. Yeah, but then, uh, like, of course, he regretted. He openly said it was my Dumhai, Dumhai idiocy. You know, idiocy. yeah, that he clearly said. So that's forty-two years he lived after the rectorship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but in it's only one year, one or two years. That's all. Yeah, one and a half years. One and a half years. That is, uh, in that time. notebooks, there are so many places. So many places, no? Where he regretted. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. reconstructing. <laughs> that's not what he did. Yeah. Others are reconstructing that. Yeah. <laughs> no, but from his uh, textual evidences, as it is coming, you don't know what it's textual. It's not textual. Marginal. In the, from the margin, not textual. I mean, what he wrote in those yeah. diaries. Yeah, you yeah. Make it a construct, reconstruct. Yeah, but uh, more or less there is some bit of remorse and regret. Yeah, but there, there are similar things like in Friday, you know. Yes. Dumb and throat extensively, you know, yes. but uh, origins of Iowa people are very easily. Yes. 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 No, Heidegger survived also because of there were many uh, damage repair by the students of both Heidegger and Husserl. It is Eugen Fink, Eugen the great figure. And most of the Heidegger students were later uh, PhD scholars with Eugen Fink. Right? So yes. Eugen Fink, I think, the professor Eugen Fink, mm-hmm. Hermann and yeah. uh, Hutsoni and all. So they created a kind of uh, post for uh, Heidegger Husserl nexus, you know, mm-hmm. like Husserl asked of Heidegger and then yes. things like that. So that's why. But 
all these recent developments, uh, I don't know. Uh, anyway, that's a biography. But then, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, thanks. Thanks for this wonderful lecture, and especially on a subject which is very um, uh, I mean, relevant and and very difficult. You know, Kant, Husserl, and Heidegger. Yeah, so, uh, and plus based on the theory, based on the propodeutic uh, theoretical foundations. So now, so there are questions definitely. Yeah, so the floor is open. So we can start from anywhere, from Kant or Husserl or Heidegger. Or from nowhere, from the worldless eye, or you can. What is the sign? Anyway, I was. I can. One thing I can tell you sure. is, uh, like, uh, as far as I can remember, these problems or these questions always discussed in the typical Husserl Kant Heidegger seminars. Sure. You know that it always discussed. I mean, sure. also Kant. Yes. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But in India, we have not been doing that. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, we do that for a while now. And yeah. especially the Heidegger reading of Kant. Right? Sure. Sure. Just uh, two points here. Sure. The first one is more of a hunch. That uh, both these philosophers are critiquing each other. And that's a fact. I and mean, so many, so much of words they are citing about. But is it, is it not the case that perhaps uh, they were dealing with two very, very different ways of philosophizing? Absolutely. And uh, their criticism of each other is more about animosity of different kind, which I say often remains between husband and wife, brothers, father and sons, teacher and students. To carry certain yeah, things. Just call me <laughs> because I believe the whole idea of the being that Heidegger is talking about, and you have rightly said that in Lustra, the question of being is of entities. And Heidegger makes it very, very clear that the being is of the two kind, that of the uh, uh, ontic and ontological itself, shows that the kind of being that he is talking with Dazan is very, very significant and different kind of a discourse altogether. So it is not about intensively, as you say, outwardly towards an object of knowledge, but about self-understanding. So I would say that even if he doesn't use the word intentionality, the entire discourse of care, that being in the world, being along with, and being ahead of, is always an intentionality driven. But it is not about, you know, making a special effort to make knowledge about the world, but about self-understanding. So I think uh, both of these philosophers are employing different methods, though of course under the banner of phenomenology. Interestingly, Schroeder has, uh, William Schroeder says yes. the one who clearly mentioned pure transcendental phenomenology for one, another existential phenomenology yes. for the other. Yes. Yes. So that would be a better way, you know, because they are doing different exercises. The second one was, uh, you were talking about Dasein, uh, in which I want to bring in, this is not mine, but uh, uh, David Sarbon, I don't know how you yeah. pronounce, Sarbon, B-O-N-E. Uh, he makes a very interesting articulation, I don't know how we would look into this. Uh, saying that Dasein, that if you make it hyphenation, being there, there being. Uh, you either see it as a noun or as a verb. As a noun, it is about being there, something, an entity like. So I am embodiment. To that extent, you can call it that Dasein is there. But the very idea of using it as a verb, that what you were hinting yeah. at, that it is always in the process of dynamic. dynamic. Dynamics. And that is where the idea of being in the capital is to be linked in, in terms of understanding the human subjectivity not as merely embodiment but always in action, always doing. And this I would say is whether uh, a German way of thinking that even in the whole notion of meaning you find in Wittgenstein the use theory that there is no definition given but it is always in an activity of doing certain things that 
sense of being there comes into being. So how would you like to, I mean, I'm yes. just trying to perhaps... No, I mean, this is to extend your argument actually. So uh, designs being there uh, is understood in many different ways. One of the very interesting way that Derrida understand design is that the notion of design is subjected to an interrogation by the thought of difference, he says. Difference would, in French would mean to differ and to differ. Now, the being with the capital B would be in a relation of difference with itself and as well as it will be in a relation of differing its own relation to others. Differing and differing will simultaneously happen with the being. If the being is being there, all the time the it will be within this network of difference, there it is. And if being falls within the network of difference, difference with the world, difference with other beings, difference with language, difference with culture, and multiple differences all around, you know, then this being is then serially raised, you know, at every ontological point where you like to locate it. If a being is in if a being B is in relationship with C, that point of relationship with C is a point of erasure of B. B is no longer there then. Derrida would say. Now some people would call it a kind of ontological nihilism, which is close to Nietzsche's notion of being. Because the being of the human being is not there. Rather, it returns to its prior you know, situation, as Nietzsche would like to say, to put it very simply. Now, what is prior to the being, prior to design? Is there anything? That is, again, a very complicated uh, way of uh, looking at uh, Heidegger, because prior to the constitution of design, there is nothing. And again, design, in its comportment, encounters the nothing of the world. It really doesn't encounter another being, as Heidegger says. So there is this process of erasure that comes up with. I go with that Derridian kind of interpretation, which is an ontological nihilism. So the outcome of it is to annihilate the idea that design can have something like a basis, which is locatable. That this is the basis of design. This is the culture. This is the basis of design. So that kind of basis is probably given up if we interpret it in this way, which will, which I would like to interpret. But one can give a different interpretation and can say that, well, it can retain basis and it can still have uh, another shape. It can still enter into a different kind of relationship with someone who is totally different. You know, all, all that is also possible. And one can reaffirm being, as Heidegger would love to do. So it is open to both this kind of interpretation, if I would say. I just want to add this. I mean, my impression, like, I want to ask this question, but it's the same what he asked, that, that you argue, you think that it's a confrontation, it's a verb in German for by game. You know, you're not, you're taking two different roads, so the, that you're no, you won't really meet at the point. This happens, is, I mean, fine, there's, a, there's always, one thing I find very interesting in Heidegger is the understanding of situatedness. Situated. Situated. Situated, last time situated, yeah. fell off to in German. It's very, yeah. very, yeah. very German that word. Yeah. Hmm? So, but this I, I would probably extend that into the history of philosophy. Sure. This has been a problem always uh, from Descartes, or uh, clearly in the idealism, German idealism. And uh, Heidegger is actually uh, inherited a lot from that that German from Hegel, Fichte, Schelling, and Kant. Where the actual problem? Where would he situ situate the man? Yeah, the, the human being, uh, and that's the that's the point of departure for Hegel, Fichte, and Schelling from Kant, from the transcendental subject, and for Fichte is in a, a combination of uh, handle that act and the thinking uh, in a really in a religious uh, structure, also the ethics sure. mostly, sure. Schelling nature and Hegel in history. Sure. So this uh, situating the man is very important. And Husserl and Heidegger, they are repeating the same. Sure. Yeah, so where the man can be situated. So that is one uh, observation. Sure. The second thing is very interesting what you said, the intentionality. Yes. The Husserl and Heidegger, how Heidegger uh, developed this concept of uh, um, uh, kind of uh, object yes. uh, without consciousness, whatever. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So 
So, and then Husserl says that a wordless eye, you know, see the, the point is the wordless eye is not possible, that is strictly from the transcendental framework. So he is committed to that transcendental phenomenological reduction, etc., etc. Whereas for, uh, for Heidegger, uh, I, I only, uh, this is my speculation, this influence of the pre-modern philosophy, the medieval scholasticism, that's very interesting because Heidegger's guru was not just exactly Husserl but Brentano. Yeah. He was so influenced by Brentano and especially by the dissertation of Brentano, the, the different meaning of being in Aristotle. So that he read and he was so inspired that etc. Et and Brentano clearly points out that uh, uh, the intentionality, uh, there are a lot of studies on intentionality. Uh, it was a major discourse in the medieval scholasticism, but for the scholastic philosophers, only the volition was intentional. Neither cognition nor sensation. But from the in, in modern philosophy, both in, 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 in cognition and the sensation are intentional. But so in the, in the uh, volition, there is some legitimacy of the object as an intentional object, but not in cognition and sensation. I think uh, annoyingly Heidegger, you know, uh, used is, that. Is going that volition. Going that volition. Very, very, yeah. you know, that's, that's very interesting point that you are making. I would like to really look at this whole yeah. And the handworker concept. Sure, and the, sure. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Uh, that is a. Uh, uh, I just want to ask a question on the three, on the on basically for from this uh, whole text of the Kant and the problem of metaphysics, sure. and uh, uh, because this is a very controversial hard issue on dedication, and writer Hendrik takes another sure. position and some other thoughts. Sure. So you have taken the position that uh, Heidegger has strongly interpreted. Sure. So uh, the way we understand the way uh, the Heidegger why Heidegger was interested in the Kant and the problem of metaphysics and the dark critique of pure reason. Sure. So he had the uh, he he had the claim that what the insight uh, Kant has in the first edition he has compromised in the second edition right. and it comes up with a uh, Kant's notion of the synthesis three four synthesis in the apprehension reproduction and recognition sure. and through uh, his interpretation of Kant critique uh, of pure reason is able to show that this basically the three kind of the synthesis can be seen as a temporal movement for the past present and future. So while with the Heidegger is able to locate, so uh, and he says actually Kant had that insight, but in the second edition, in the practical interest of the pure reason, he actually compromised it and gave primacy to the transcendental unity of a perception. Now Heidegger's point, Heidegger's take is that only through by uh, by which he has to locate the finitude of the design. That the transcendence for the design is possible through, the, through its finitude or through its finitude. So one thing is that, that how do we see that there are different, altogether different stakes while interpreting the Kant's critique of pure theory. And second, uh, uh, as Professor William also pointed out, that this debate and uh, between confrontation between Russell and Heidegger. So one is uh, that their whole approach to the phenomenology, what is the goal of the phenomenology. And as we know that in the Vena lecture, Husserl clearly argued that the goal of the phenomenology is to establish, uh, to become an eidetic sign, to as in a regular sign which was, uh, become the foundation. And his methodology was that through the epochy you can really work out, you can really get this transcendental structure transparently. On the other hand, Heidegger has the problem with that, that through the being, being cannot be made uh, transparent in this way. And only through, uh, you know, only through uh, the, uh, only you can uh, refer to the being and that is why he takes the theological, like the logical motive like wetting be. And the only relationship is possible in the terms of the letting be. Where this anthro uh, there anthropological way of uh, uh, making, uh, the, uh, making the being tra uh, transparent is not possible. And the last uh, question I want to ask is, that one of the, uh, the way you, uh, there was a many way in which you have differentiated between uh, Husserl and Heidegger's confrontation by the difference. 
and one of the interesting in confrontation is taken by the Bernard Stiegler in the time and technique. Yes. When he says that uh, basically if we see the, in the internal time consciousness, Husserl talks, talks about this lived time. The retention potential is there, but the time is the lived time of the design consciousness. Sure. But on the other hand, Heidegger talks about the time of the ancestor, right. which is not the, the time of the ancestor yes. or the history, which is not in the lived framework, lived right. time of the uh, also, uh, of the design, sure. but yet it affects. Yes. So for him, this authentic historicality or this, uh, this uh, the one of the primary move of uh, uh, problem with uh, the general time consciousness is right. how to account for this rhetorical time, which is not the part of the consciousness, yet it shapes. So this aporia Paul Iker also shows it in, uh, uh, so how do you respond to it? Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. It's the most interesting question yeah. that one can think about it. Uh, as, I mean, one way is Heidegger's way of thinking, that internal time consciousness is nothing but uh, simultaneously potentiality for the future and actuality that one is. It's a, it's a kind of a uh, opening towards both actuality and potentiality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what is actual? One can reflect on that. And if one reflects on actual, one goes back in time. So time consciousness goes backward, reaches another point of time which is already lived by. So lived experience, so lived time becomes part of this regression backward. And then comes the question of potentiality. What is the final, ultimate form of potentiality? Potentiality to die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And potentiality to die, or death as potentiality, as it happens in Heidegger, mm -hmm. is also a search towards authenticity. So potentiality, death, and authenticity come together. The moment the subject thinks of its own future. And what it encounters in its own future is an empty time time which is without the subject but not without an experience of the world. There is a subjectless experience of the world as the subject looks towards the future. So Heidegger gives a certain kind of interpretation. You can see this. And this interpretation again he calls it a kind of a historicity you know, that it is historicized internal time consciousness historicizes the being. Now in what sense he is using historicality or historicization? In the sense of horizon of understanding. Historicity has nothing to do with history per se, but it has to do with the horizon of understanding. And horizon of understanding is free form at one level. At another level it is forged, you know, as Gadamer shows. It is forged when the subject looks towards the future. It is forged somewhere. Now this forging and forming of the horizon. If that is historicality, which is not related to concrete history, it's rather a withdrawal from the concrete history, and that's what many uh, commentators have pointed out Heidegger, that Heidegger doesn't go along. He creates an understanding of history in the being, in a manner that the being can withdraw itself from the concrete forms of history. So there is a withdrawal retreat from history, in Heidegger. a retreat, a uh, kind of a retreat from history. So one needs to retrieve probably from there in order to bring back Heidegger into history, which is again very complicated, to which I have not thought about. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Yeah, all this is very interesting. Uh, yeah. It's a fascinating account of this uh, uh, controversy, and, uh, which is also a great conflict between student and teacher. Yes. <laughs> Uh, always, that's a very healthy situation. Yes. Uh, after, uh, after dedicating the uh, being, after dedicating being and time to Husserl. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there are so many other such instances where conflict is very productive and healthy. Much uh, things come on. Uh, killing your own father. <laughs> father <Fatal> mort. <laughs> it's father mort. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. And uh, um, now it's a, I mean. The, Term that I always keep in mind is uh, possibility in Heidegger words. Um, and uh, so it, it has a certain, as far as I can see, it has 
an element that's already coming from Kant, mm-hmm. in terms of what the Kant's categories, sure. possibility is one of the modality, modality as yes. opposed to yes. uh, being in the, and uh, necessity. Sure. And uh, so, so the human, uh, the subject is in so many different state, states of possibility, and so many things are uh, possible, but then, as you just pointed out, confronted with the possibility of death, which is actually not only the potentiality, but the but the possibility of absolute impossibility. That is sure. uh, how uh, yeah. how Heidegger yeah. defines uh, death. Sure. Uh, possibility of death, which is the possibility of uh, absolute impossibility. Yes. And that's very yeah. important yes, for, yeah. for Levinas. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And in all this, uh, the... Uh, now, the most important thing, as far as I can see, and maybe wrong in this, uh, when he brings up history um, away from the, the sphere of reason and as it was pointed out it is to show activity and action and uh, activity of the subject so therefore and that activity is, a, is, is both uh, activity can be understood both in terms of progressivity as well as critical. So, a very strong dimension of critical, a very strong critical dimension comes out, which is also historical, historically understood. And in this respect, uh, Heidegger is connected with Nietzsche. Hmm? Nietzsche is historical understanding uh, how terms of morality are stuck, and therefore one has to move forward in history from that point. And then there's also critical notions of morality, which is the set and people cannot remain stuck, stuck there. So, uh, and there probably uh, Muslim doesn't understand this dimension of critical in the lived world. So it's, it is far more descriptive, even if it tries to understand historicity. And it doesn't have a critical dimension in, the, in relation to the lived world. Okay, you have to describe the lived world in terms of reason and so on. And therefore he is trying to say, he is sticking on to what he referred to as anthropology. And that's the only thing he can do, because in anthropology there is no criticism. It is entirely, entirely non critical and often non historical It just cannot uh, uh, deal with it. And uh, the, the, the next point uh, was what you pointed out as guilt. And yeah, that's an interesting point. I never knew that. That's a remark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Challenge of yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem of guilt. Yes. And uh, now this is here. Yeah, uh, Husserl seems to be seeing this problem. What you actually pointed out, the problem of authenticity is being spoken of in terms of guilt. Yes. And uh, but then, uh, so that is in a way uh, accepting. Whatever is going on in the lived world, what uh, uh, Heidegger called chapter, no, yes, chapter, all right, and then uh, that can be that should be considered as acceptable. And uh, living in that world of chapter uh, that Heidegger points out, uh, Husserl sees, uh, sees as Heidegger's as representing Heidegger's sense of guilt. So that, uh, as you just said. The retreat from that is because uh, live, there is a gift in living in that kind of world. But then, on the other hand, for Heidegger, it is not a, not just a matter of guilt, but a critique yes. of that world. Uh-huh. So it is, there's a there's a difference between a lived world as it can be described, anthropologically or rationally, or whatever, and the alternative world to live. Yes. You know? And that is what he's aiming at. And that alternative world is uh, required to have a certain kind of uh, purification. Sure. And that is a problem, you know, that, that is partly coming from Nietzsche. Yes. That kind of uh, sure. purification. Sure. I, I mean, if not purification, the, the immediate kind of context of living, which is, which is to say, accepting that in Nietzsche it is accepting the sensations yes. of the lived world. Um, and in a way, the idea of becoming yes. is to be in tune sure. with that 
with the real living world, with the world that is one is living, and that's so for nature also. So that uh, one one is doing that, one is being critical. The world that one has been uh, unconsciously living in. So the role of consciousness probably is to make this the nature of the lived world that one passes by and sees and approaches it with, it with a critical attitude. So I guess what is missing there is when uh, the soul speaks of guilt, it is the critical damage. And it is, and so there, there is a uh, lineage from Nietzsche to uh, Heidegger to Levinas and so on, which manifest themselves in very different ways. And much of this current from post Heideggerian current takes up that kind of critical attitude very seriously as part of philosophy. And, uh, and when, when this critical attitude is strongly projected, people think that this is not philosophy. Philosophy is deceptive, potentially rational and anthropological, and so on. You know, if you introduce criti- criticism in a strong sense of the lived condition, lived world, and so on, uh, one should not uh, consider it as a serious philosophy. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is why there's always a tension. I mean, of course, it's there in Frankfurt School, which is coming from Marxism, clearly. You know, so it is a different kind of criticism. And which is in, which is not in agreement with uh, this current. You know. sure.